What's good y'all, it's your boy Ross back at again with another video. So I'm finally getting back home from leaving the In The Clutch Studios. Had a great time for the live stream reactions with the homies. The OG crew was there today. Um, we uh, enjoyed Bad Blood as a whole. All of us did. Shout out to Dub, True Billy, and uh, Steve, man. Sir Dance a lot, man. Like... We had a great time. You guys had a great time. Shout out to everyone that watched us on Twitch and YouTube. And man, this show was fun. It started off with a banger of a Hell in a Cell. And it ended off with a banger of a match between uh, Roman Reigns and Cody Rhodes versus Solo Sokoa and Jacob Fatu. And the ending after the match was just even more fantastic. And then... After the show went off the air, some more crash out happened. And it's like, man, even though there was some crash outs during the show, after the show, more crash outs happened. This was just great. And we're going to talk about all of that, man. Hey, this is how you do a PLE. This is this the build for these matches for the most part was great. And it just has... A lot of people talking, a lot of people buzzing on what's next. What's going to happen at Crown Jewel? We got to talk about some implications there. It's, it's some crazy stuff that went on for this show. So I'm not going to lie to you. Not going to lie to you. We're going to start with the main event. We got to start with the main event because right now that's what everyone's talking about. And we're going to work our way through the rest of the matches. I'm not going to go into every match in great detail, but I'm going to talk about some of the things that was, you know, I had to make mention of. I barely could take notes today, bro. I'm not going to lie to you. My notes are pretty trash because I was just so invested in what was going on here. So, we're going to get this out the way. Roman and Cody versus Solo and Jacob Fatu. Now, this was the main event. I know a lot of people wanted the Hell in a Cell to be a main event, and it definitely could have. But the reason why it wasn't the main event and this was, it made sense in the grand scheme of things. So, Solo and Jacob come out to uh, Solo's music. Or was about uh, a good... Uh, I'm being generous and giving them a thousand. I'm only giving them a thousand because of the pyro and the other 500. Pyro go, gets a thousand, a uh, 500. And then Jacob Fatu gets the other 500. Because, you know what I'm saying? That's about it. <laughs> it, was, it was kind of a bland entrance. Now, you're probably wondering, why would you say that? Well, Cody comes out there with an HBCU band, UAPB. Shout out to them. I, you know, I come from Prayer View, graduate from Prayer View. So, you know, it's always cool to see an HBCU band out there. And UAPB was out there and they were surrounding um, his ring. And they were playing his theme music, which I thought was actually... Uh, pretty dope. So shout out to UAPB. Um, that is for those who don't know the Arkansas Pine Bluff Marching uh, Musical Machine. That's their band. Uh, they were there playing Cody's theme song, and then Cody came out there. I thought that was pretty dope. That was a cool moment to see that. But you know, you know, Roman's not gonna be upstage. That was some good. That was some good aura. You know, what I'm saying I'm gonna give that about three to five k on the aura scale. You know, Rome, uh, Solo and Jacob, collectively, they only had 1,000. Maybe if Jacob came out to his theme music, maybe put it at 2,000, 3,000. But Cody, you had a 5,000, 6,000 aura scale. Roman comes out there. Got the orchestra playing and stuff. You know he can't let Cody upstage him. He comes out there. He's walking in slow motion while the fireworks are going off behind him. He's not looking back. He's just in this slow-mo, cool mode. He just stands there, looks fucking like a superstar or over 10 fucking thousand. What are we talking about? Crowd went crazy. Everybody in the arena. There was 16,000 people there tonight. Over 16,000. Everybody in the arena put their ones up. We haven't seen the guy wrestle since WrestleMania. We got something here. Roman Reigns, he is in his bag. He is in this untouchable aura bag, and I fucking love it, right? This was great, bro. Great way to really show these are the top guys in the company. And you have Solo and Jacob trying to take them down. Um, I like the tension at the beginning of this match. Them 
both teams strategizing who's going to start first. So they let Cody start off first. And they let him go against Jacob Fatu. Roman's like, you sure you want to do that? So and I, I like that. And then I, I like the teasing back and forth for Solo getting into the match. And then Roman getting into the match. And then having their back and forth. So I did enjoy the pace. You know the a Bloodline match is going to take time. They're going to build up the pace. And that's exactly what happened here, man. This was so fun. Um, at one point... Um, Cody is starting to get packed up. No, Roman's starting to get packed up. Cody gets in, but then he starts getting heat on him. And during the middle part of the match, it's really Cody trying to find his way to tag Roman. And I like the fact that Roman did have his back. He kept his word. He kept his word, and he did have his back. So I do appreciate that. I like that aspect of the storytelling. But... There is a one sequence where they really show Jacob Fatu as the next guy up, this, this dominant force. Um, I want to say Roman's laying in the ring. Jacob does that beautiful uh, step-up springboard. Where he hits the second rope and hits the third rope and then springboards off of it uh, onto Roman. And then Solo on the opposite end hits a splash from the top rope on the opposite turnbuckle. And it looked like it was about to be over, but Cody ended up coming for the save. And I like the fact that Jacob was able to shine in this match. You also get a lot of trash talk from uh, from Solo here, kind of taking you know shades of what happened uh, when Roman was the Tribal Chief. He was talking this trash. So it's you you can see that these are some of the things that Solo picked up on just watching Roman. Roman didn't really talk too much like he normally would, you know, in his, you know, prior matches. But in this particular match, Solo was talking a lot of trash. So this is where the match really kicks it into like the fucking ninth gear. So at this point, Solo and Cody are outside the ring and it looks like, um, Solo's trying to, you know, charge at Cody, but um, Solo ends up, you know, running through the barricade. Cody's, not Solo, Jacob. Jacob ends up running through the barricade, and Solo ends, um, not Solo, Cody ends up st sidestepping him. So he runs through the timekeeper's barricade. You think he's out, right? Normally, that knocks somebody out. Not fucking Jacob. I don't, he's made of Samoan vibranium because he immediately gets back up and starts throwing chairs. He starts throwing chairs. Eventually, Cody has to try to incapacitate him again and he hits uh, him with the uh, crossroads onto the floor outside in front of the announce table. So at that point, he's like, all right, man, I'm going to have to do something because even when he hit the crossroads on Jacob, he was still stirring. Normally, that, that takes somebody out. So he starts hitting them with kicks, and then he ends up kicking them onto the announce table. And I like this spot so much. Cody goes to the top rope. He looks at Roman, who's in the ring with uh, Solo, and he basically gives him the salute like, hey, take care of this, my boy. I'm about to take out Jacob Fatu. And Cody jumps from the top rope onto Jacob Fatu, through the announce table, uh, announce table to essentially eliminate him from the match. Him and Cody are out. They're done. Which, once again, made sense. And it's a callback to how Jacob Fatu did the same thing to Cody when uh, he arrived on, on WWE television on SmackDown. He did the same thing to Cody. Went to the top row, took him out. That's the exact same thing here. I thought that was a nice callback. And it protects Jacob because now, once again, someone had to go to the extreme. Either Jacob hurts himself or someone had to go to the extreme to eliminate him because he that's how much of a dangerous force he is. So he doesn't get pinned. He doesn't eat a loss in the sense of he was part of the loss. He got taken out. You still protect him. So we got Roman and Solo in the ring. But you knew the Tongans were going to get involved. And as they do get involved, the numbers game gets the best of Roman. And at this point, Solo, you can hear him visibly say, Hey, man, this is your fault. Why you lie to me? You told me 
I was the next one up. You told me I was the next tribal chief. Why you lied to me? And it was one of those things where you can hear the pain in his voice. You can hear the sadness in his voice. But it it, it is a callback because, you know, Roman did tell him that. You're the next guy up. So Solo took that opportunity. But now it's like, nah, you're not the next guy up. So I like that part. I like him being vulnerable and saying, bro, you lied to me. You said I was the next tribal chief. Like, what's up? And the way they framed this was so good. So you don't initially see him, but the Tongans are outside the ring. And then there's somebody in a black hoodie. He has a black hoodie and a black bandana. And you know what? It, it's always some wrestler with a black hoodie that you got to be careful with. And lo and behold, as Solo's looking and he's about to, you know, spike Roman, he looks over and he's like, he's looking like he's seen a ghost. And Jimmy takes off the mask, takes down the bandana, uh, bandana and he's looking right at Solo. Super kicks Tonga Loa and Tama Tonga. And it was such a really good moment. Crowd pop crazy. Ultimately, the distraction costs Solo. Roman ends up hitting Solo with a beautiful spear for the one, the two, the three. And Jimmy's return cost Solo the match. Fucking loved it. And Roman and Cody win the match. This was fun. This was fucking fun. Great, great match. Great build. Good storytelling. It was fantastic. And you see Jimmy. You see Roman. And Roman can't believe it. And finally they hug and embrace. Because you know, Roman had treated Jimmy less than. He was treating Jimmy bad. And Jimmy came back and helped him. It was a beautiful moment. Beautiful moment. So... They turn, you see Cody, he's holding the championship. And they just, they look at each other. And Roman gives him that nod like, hey, I'll be seeing you soon. They, you know, we're going we gonna to run this back. I'm going to get my title. Words were said without words being said. Like that. They're not best friends, nor should they. So Roman and Jimmy leave. And you see nothing but the bloodline hooligans say, hey, we lost. But guess what, Cody? We still going to beat your ass. So they packing up Cody. I mean, beating him up. Roman and Jimmy walking up the ramp. They look back. They see it's happening. And Roman made it very clear. He's like, look, bro. I said one time. That's it. Ain't got nothing to do with me. I said I'll help him one time. Uh, this was a one-time deal. And Jimmy's like, come on, bro. We can't leave this nigga, bro. Like, this nigga. And Jacob's going to the top rope. He's about to kill him. Like, Cody's essentially dead. He's about to die. And they say, all right, bro. Roman's like, fuck it. So they go in there, Roman and Jimmy, and they dispatch the bloodline. They help out Cody. And Cody had dropped the title. So Roman picks up the title. He's looking at it because he hasn't had it in so long. And he ends up giving the WWE Undisputed Championship to Cody. Reluctantly, but he gives it to him. And there's that. That mutual respect between them. They're not friends, but they still that mutual respect. They helped each other. So all three are standing in the ring, and all of a fucking sudden you hear, if you smell, crowd goes crazy. Ridiculous pop. What else do I got to say? Just ridiculous pop. Just stupid pop. Fantastic, bro. Everybody go crazy. Rock comes out there. And he doesn't say a single word. He doesn't say a single word. He's just looking. He looks at all the three in the, in the ring. And this is where things get a little tricky. Because there's a, there's people trying to speculate some things that we don't know yet. Which is good. But The Rock puts up one, a two, and a three. And he essentially cuts his neck. He, he does the brow first, the eyebrow, looking at everybody. The one, two, and three, he cuts his neck. And before all that happens, you see the bloodline, the new bloodline, they kind of they scurry away through the crowd. It's like they don't want no smoke with the rock. 
So clearly, for what that was, he's not happy. He didn't have to say anything. He's not happy about what he just saw. Because essentially, he just saw Roman give the title back to Cody. He handed him the title. And that would make sense why The Rock would feel some type of way. Not only did you lose at WrestleMania, you lost the title, the title that signifies greatness in our family. You're tag teaming with him to beat one of your own family members down from being the new tribal chief because you lost. And now you help them again. You help him again and you willingly hand him the title. Of course, he's not going to like that. And then he walks off. He doesn't say nothing. And the show ends. But he instantly is on Instagram Live. And we watch that. And basically, you know, he's just talking his stuff. You know, he's walking by the production trucks. He sees Stone Cold. He's like, that's my buddy. He see uh, Dusty Rhodes' face on the production truck. He's like, I love you, Dusty. But I hate your son. I fucking love that. And he's just talking his shit. And he does mention all of them in the ring. He mentions... The three guys in the ring. And he's not happy. He doesn't go into great detail. It's just a little bit more tease. It's like he's not happy with what he saw. He's not, but he's back. So, and then he ends up getting in his truck and he drives off. And I just, I'm like, this, they got something here, bro. This is going to be good. Because they can go so many directions. And after all that, apparently, you got uh, um, Cody Rhodes by his tour bus. Kevin Owens approaches him. They're having a conversation. It gets heated. Gets intense. KO ends up pushing uh, Cody. And then he starts swinging off on Cody Rhodes and starts packing him up and stomping him in front of his tour bus. It seems like Cody, for whatever reason, gets his ass whooped right in front of his tour bus. Why? Don't know. But he's getting beat up. Security comes out there to break it up. Cody's in fetal position. And KO essentially storms off after security break it up. KO heel turn has happened off camera. This was cool. And what made this dope is this was footage from other people watching them. Like fans and stuff like that. Maybe plants, who know. But the idea that this didn't come from WWE. This came from other people. They set it up where people will be recording Cody and KO having a conversation and then they kind of played off of it. It's like they kept a little bit of the kayfabe alive. I can appreciate that. In an era where, you know, social media kind of ruins a lot of things. I can appreciate that. I thought that was dope. So we got the heel turn of KO. So I'm sure Cody's going to address that on Monday Night Raw. The question is, what's going to happen at Crown Jewel? Now, I'm going to talk about that. Um, I guess we might as well talk about it now, honestly. We might as well talk about it now because there's some implications here. So, during the show, I want to say this was after the Finn and Damian Priest match, which we'll get to t uh, later. You had Triple H come out there. Triple H came out there, so you're trying to figure out what this Triple H got to say, you know, what what's... what's What's on Triple H's mind? So, Triple H comes out there. There's a, a obviously there's going to be some new title. You see, it's like a new title, but it's covered. You don't know what's going on. So, he announces that Crown Jewel is coming up. And he wanted to do something different for Crown Jewel. So, they decided to hold uh, a set of matches. The top champion, men and women champion, champions, will be going against each other respectively from their brand. So, Gunther, the World Heavyweight Champion, will be going against Cody, the WWE Undisputed Champion, and whoever wins will end up getting this Crown Jewel Edition Championship belt. It's a crazy-looking belt. It's just bedazzled with fucking jewels. It looks pretty cool. I I, I don't have a problem with it, but it's, it's a novelty belt. It... it it reminds me of the, if y'all remember the greatest uh, greatest battle royal belt. It was just a belt that you won, but you can't defend. It's just like a novelty belt. Essentially, that's what it is. And it basically, the crown, who's the, the supreme champion at Crown Jewel. And the same thing with the women. Liv 
who's the current champion right now, will be going one-on-one -on -one against Nia Jax, who's the other champion on SmackDown, the head champion, which that's going to be crazy. I don't know how that's going to play out. But um, And no titles on the line. This is just to win this as like, like a novelty belt. I personally, I don't know how I feel about it because... This is the thing about these Saudi shows. They put on matches that normally wouldn't happen. Normally, some of these matches would not happen. It's because the Saudi government wants it, so they're going to put on some type of match to make some type of like storyline that doesn't need to happen, but it's only happening because it's happening as, as Saudi, in Saudi. So, I don't know. But the implications here of Cody and Gunther, one, they do have history with Cody. Gunther being eliminated by Cody for, uh, I think that was uh, right before WrestleMania 39. You know, Gunther being out there for the entire time and then getting eliminated by Cody. So there is history there. But the idea is potentially before the whole Kevin Owens attack, having Cody potentially lose at the hands of The Rock interfering to really solidify like, nah, bro, you're not winning that. No, 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 no. I want that title from you. So, possibly. So that could be a direction. Because I do think Gunther's winning. I think they're trying to present him as this really, really unstoppable force. It's just putting two of your top champions together to win a, a fucking title. And that's not really going to mean much. I don't know. I don't know. None of your top champions should really be losing to another top champion. Unless you're going to do a, a champion versus champion type situation for Survivor Series. So I don't know which they're not doing, looks like it. So, I don't know. But with this situation going on with Kevin Owens, honestly, maybe Kevin Owens is the one that cost him against Gunther. You could do that. You could. And it's a toss-up because you know that Saudi government's going to pay big bucks to have The Rock come out there. And I don't know. So, we'll see how that plays out. But I definitely did think about that. Now, on the other end, the whole Liv Morgan and and Nia, that situation, that may have to change. The reason why I say that may have to change, well, let's get into that match. I know I'm kind of all over the place, but it's tr I'm trying to you know piece things together as we go along. So let's get into that match. I'm not going to go into great detail with that one. Uh, this match was enjoyable, but the ending kind of kind of was weird. So, Dominic's in the shark cage. They raised up the shark cage. Dominic's afraid of height. If you paid attention, the shark cage was never really locked. They didn't put a lock on it. So, all Dominic has to do is just open it, and then the door will open. So, uh, I do like the fact that Rhea um, looked dominant at first. Rhea was packing up Liv as she says She has the size advantage. But Liv... And I think this is one of Lil's better matches, especially as a heel. She started targeting the bad knee, started targeting the bad leg. And at that point, that was pretty much her offensive threat to basically break break down uh, uh, Rhea to a, a less strong vertical base if you can take down her leg. And I mean, I live out here hitting a, uh, a essentially like a sunset flip off the, the ring onto the ringside barricade. Like, it was a nice move. She even tried to do the Three Amigos to tribute to Eddie Guerrero in a disrespectful way, of course. But uh, Rhea ended up stopping it. And at one point, Rhea ends up... Bruh, and this is where I like that they show the, the level of strength between Liv and Rhea. Rhea starts to pack up Liv. Dominic's watching as the cage is open or whatever. And Rhea ends up hitting the Riptide. First, she throws Liv into the bear cage right below Dominic, then hits the Riptide onto the floor. Throws her back in the ring, and she can end the match. But then Dominic falls. He's falling. He's hanging upside down. His foot is stuck on a chain to the... Shark cage, but he's hanging upside down. So, she can win the match, but she doesn't. She tells the ref, hey, I gotta get, I gotta go get some get back real quick. And the ref says, 
okay, go ahead. So, <laughs> I don't know why, but go ahead. So, Rhea goes to under the ring, gets a kendo stick, and le proceeds to beat the hell out of Dominic with that kendo stick as if he was a fucking pinata. Fucking great. Love that shit. Chef's kiss. That was beautiful, right? So he's doing, she's whooping him like a government mule, trying to get some goddamn candy out of him, right? The ref comes over there to stop it. But this is where the match gets weird. It doesn't make sense. Ref comes over there and stops it. All of a sudden, behind her is Raquel Rodriguez. She makes her return. She attacks Rhea Ripley. And then the ref sees it. So the ref sees Raquel Rodriguez attack Rhea Ripley as she throws her back into the ring. And then he calls for the bell because it's a disqualification at that point. And then L Raquel throws Liv's lifeless body on top of Rhea, but the match is already over. Liv has been disqualified with the help of Raquel Rodriguez. And then Raquel picks up Liv, they start smiling, and then they walk out as Dominic gets help. And it was just like, huh? And here's the thing, even the announcers try to cover it up or try to play into it like, oh, uh, Raquel just threw uh, Liv on the Rhea as a metaphorical win. I don't think that was supposed to happen. I, it, just, it just doesn't make sense for Raquel to not have waited for the ref to have his back to completely turn, unless the ref turned too soon, because he went back to the ring, it seemed like too soon. Because I think the spot's supposed to be, maybe he's focusing on Dominic, or whatever the case may be. Raquel comes out there, attacks, he doesn't see it. She throws her back into the ring, and then Liv gets the cover, or maybe uh, Raquel covers Liv, as Dominic is being held and checked on by the referee. Um, and she, you know, the ref doesn't see that Raquel tacked Rhea. And then Raquel puts Liv over Rhea for the one, two, three. He goes back in the ring, counts the one, two, three. Because I think the win, the, the win would have been, it would have made sense if Liv pinned her again. Not because she beat her, because Raquel helped her. So I don't know. That was a very weird ending. Y'all let me know how y'all felt about that. But ultimately, made sense. Raquel does have beef with Rhea. And, you know, uh, Raquel and Rhea uh, live for tag team at one point. So it makes sense. I can I can appreciate that. That that was a good uh, continuity story lineup. It's just how they executed it wasn't the best. Now, I bring this up because we go back now to what's going to happen between Liv being still the champ going against Nia Jax at Crown Jewel I don't see that one is two heels going against each other I don't know I just don't see that but I guess maybe because she has Raquel in her corner so you could possibly do that unless we get a Tiffany Stratton cash in beforehand since we're talking about Tiffany Stratton let's go ahead and talk about that match uh, Nia versus Bailey. They had a impossible task to follow up that Hell in a Cell, which I can't wait to talk about because we're definitely going to get into that one. But they had the impossible task to follow up such a great match. They were doomed from the start. They were. Nia was dominating Bailey from the beginning, majority of the beginning of the match. Uh, Nia was even trying to make Bailey tap out with a, a submission. Um, at one point there was some type of botch. I don't know if they were trying to do a Hurricane Rana, but Nia, uh, was pretty much being held up top. Like Bailey had her held up top. And then I guess, you know, the motion of them flipping over was supposed to make Bailey flip. But when it happened, Nia just failed and Bailey sold the flip. She just flipped on her own. So that didn't really look too good. Uh, even at one point, Nia hit uh, Bailey to belly um, on Bailey. That, that was actually a, a, a pretty cool sequence. Seeing someone hit your finisher on you 
Uh, you know, it's kind of an ironic thing. Most of the time, it doesn't happen. It's not really that effective because people end up, you know, kicking out of their own finisher. But it was still cool to see uh, Naya hitting to hitting the is it ba belly to belly. I think it's uh, Bailey the Belly, something like that. I believe that's what it's called. Um, and you can see Nia just trying different moves to put away uh, Bailey. But you knew Tiffany was going to get involved. Tiffany comes out there, attacks Bailey with the briefcase. And now Bailey and Nia are both knocked out. Refs in the ring, briefcase in the ring. And it becomes a situation where it looks. Like, um, Tiffany is going to cash in, but then all of a sudden, Naya sits up like Kane because she had all like red and black on. She sits up like Kane and was looking at her like, "Bro, were you about to cash in on me? What the hell's going on here?" So they're teasing it for sure. So after that, Bailey goes to the top rope. Obviously, uh, Tiffany distracts. Bailey just enough for uh Naya to hit a Samoan drop from the second rope, then dragged her to the corner and hit that little uh like squashing maneuver. I'm not sure what the name is. I'm sure y'all let me know. Where she pretty much jumps from like the second rope again or something like that and squashes her opponent. So, and that's how Naya ends up retaining, which I figured, but the real story here is obviously. When is Tiffany going to cash in? So I bring this back up. Does Tiffany cash in before we get the crown jewel? And then we get a Tiffany versus Liv match? Or does she cash in during the match? Or after the match? Because the titles are not on the line. So maybe that happens. The question becomes, what happens here? I think the one out they give Liv is Raquel's going to be her muscle. That's what's going to help her. If they do live versus Nia, Raquel's going to be her muscle. So that's how things may play out. I don't know. Y'all let me know how y'all feel. But sorry, I'm a little congested under the weather. I've had, I mean, you know, weather down here is changing up crazy. But we got to talk about the match I was looking forward to the most. I think the match that a lot of us was looking forward to the most, that is Drew. McIntyre versus CM Punk Hell in a Cell This was fun bro This was fun This was everything it needed to be bro This is how you do a Hell in a Cell They gave us blood They gave us intensity They gave us pain They gave us story They gave us hate And I loved every second of it Every single second of this match was fire this was a great way to start off bad blood so they started off with stiff intense ta attacks after talking shit to each other and drew pulled out a toolbox immediately and we started going to home depot because my man pulled out some wrenches and wrenches get used a lot in this particular match uh CM punk uh used a wrench to try to bust open uh, Drew early, tried to get some blood, tried to get some color from Drew, but that didn't end up happening. Drew ends up hitting a Claymore early in the match while they were on the ring floor. And at this point, Drew started turning up. Drew was making it his mission to beat the living crap out of him. Drew ends up using a wrench of his own on CM Punk and hit him in the head, which busted him wide open. We got some color, and Drew, he was like a kid in the candy shop. Once he saw CM Punk bleeding, uh, he turned up even more. Uh, then at later on in the match, CM Punk hit Drew with the, uh, with the same toolbox in the head, and he really got some juice because he was leaking profound. Profusely, his full face was covered. I was like, oh, yeah, we, we're getting somewhere right now. Um, Drew uh, hits a, no, CM Punk ends up hitting a, a, a go to sleep, but Drew rolls out the ring. Then Drew hits another uh, Claymore kick for a close two count. They start trading punches in the ring, and Drew and CM Punk end up crashing through a table uh, on the outside that they had set up. But Drew wasn't done. No, 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 no. 
Drew was not done. So Drew was one of the first people to end up getting up from that. CM Punk is taking a quite little good little nap. So after that, you end up getting Drew putting the steel steps into the ring. And you knew it was about to uh it was about to get uh pretty serious. Drew uh, Drew had some devious thoughts on his mind. Um CM Punk ends up hitting uh, another second GTS for a close fall. Then Drew uh, uh, drops CM Punk onto the steel steps for a close two fall. He body, he body, you know, like carries him and then drops him onto the steel steps. Ultimately, Drew fell onto the steel steps as well. It hurt him, but it was still a close two fall. So, at this point, there's a situation where Drew is uh, pretty much caught in the anaconda vice. He's caught into the end of kind of vice or whatnot. And he ends up, Drew picks, you know, there's a, a, a wrench next to him. He's trying to hit him with it, but CM Punk gets it and starts stabbing him repeatedly over and over and over. Blood just dripping. This was such a beautiful shot. And CM Punk called it. He said, I'm going to want you there's going to be a point where there's blood dripping down your face. You're trying to wipe it from your eyes. And you're going to be begging me to for forgiveness. And we got to that point. Drew's begging him. He's begging him. CM Punk's about to stab him. Yeah, yeah, he don't give a fuck. God's not here. He's not helping you tonight. But he ends up getting hit with the low blow. CM Punk is pretty much laying on the steel steps. And this is when things get even more diabolical, but it backed flyer. It backfired on Drew. Drew pulls out a bag. Now you're thinking in any type of hell in a cell match, somebody pulls out like some type of bag. Most likely it's maybe thumbtacks or something. No, he pulls out a bag, <clears throat> and it's a bag of the friendship beads, the friendship base bracelet beads. It's a full bag. He pours it all over him. Some of it ends up in his mouth. He backs up. He's about to hit CM Punk with the Claymore kick. And this is probably one of the most brutal spots of the entire night, damn near. CM Punk moves out the way. But as he moves out the way, Drew McIntyre's lower back hits the edge of the steel steps. He missed. He, he went for the Claymore kick. CM Punk stepped out the way. It hits his lower back, hits the edge of the steel steps. When I say... Woo-hoo-hoo. That looked brutal. I mean brutal. Drew is done. He's out of it. He's writhing in pain. But CM Punk's like, nah, we're going to go to that place. He proceeds to wrap his knee with a chain from the toolbox. Then he proceeds to go over there, pick up some of the bees that's on the ground, shove them in Drew's mouth the same way he did his own beads from his wrist a few weeks back. Shoved them in his mouth, picked them up, and hit him with the GTS with the, the steel chain wrapped around his knee for the one, the two, the three. And the match was done. <clears throat> this, this is how you do Hell in a Cell. This is how you do it. This is the first Hell in a Cell. There was blood with uh, the Edge and uh, Finn Balor one. I believe that was at uh, WrestleMania uh, 39. That was a solid one. I enjoyed that one. That was a fun Hell in a Cell. We got some blood there. I don't think it was intentional, though. But we did get blood there. This was intentional, and I loved it. This is what Hell in a Cell is supposed to be out. Wow. It lived up to the hype, in my opinion. The story was there. The hatred was there. And I loved it. I love every second of it. And even after the match, CM Punk is falling to the ground. He's selling it because he should be. He had a war. They're trying to give him oxygen. He's over here like, man, I'm trying to get to my wife. I love this. They sold the destruction of the cell. Blood everywhere. Chaos everywhere. And this has gone down. It will go down. It's one of the best feuds WWE has produced all year. And it's over. Question is, what's next for CM Punk? Well, he may have a crash course uh, with Gunther supposedly at Survivor Series. So we'll see how that plays out. But overall, that was fun. 
Great way to start off show. Love that Hell in a Cell match. And Bad Blood as a whole. This PLE as a whole. Chef's Kiss. I loved it. I loved it. I can't wait to see what happens on Monday Night Raw and SmackDown. This was great. Comment down below. Let me know. What y'all rate the show on a scale of 1 to 10 for me? Oh, I'm sorry, guys. I forgot to talk about another match. I'm about to end the damn review. We're going to keep this going. I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm mixed up. We got to talk about Finn versus Damien before we get out of here. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 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 So, Finn uh, ends up coming out there. He had some type of bag over his head. I was just like, what the hell is this, Finn? Finn comes out there. Uh, Damien Priest comes out there. And Damien Priest starts packing up Finn. I mean, he starts beating the living crap out of Finn Balor, as he should try to get some type of offense going in. Uh, ultimately, Finn Balor was able to get some good offense himself. But we got to get towards the end of the match because you knew the Judgment Day was going to get involved, and that's what happened. So as the Judgment Day members come out there to try to assist, obviously uh, Damian Priest doing the best he can to hold them off, which he was for the most part towards the end of the match. Damian Pre uh Finn, Finn Balor starts hitting Damian with the coup de gras. Because he hit him with the coup de gras once, but he kicked out. So he starts hitting him with the coup de gras, but he's stomping on his back. But Damian Priest is not falling. He does it from like two different turnbuckles. Then he gets caught on the third turnbuckle, thinking he's gonna jump on his back again. He gets caught. Uh um Damian Priest catches him by the throat, hits him with a south of heaven for the one, two, three. And Damian Priest beats Finn Balor even with Finn Balor having help and I figured that was going to happen because once again like I've been saying he's been getting packed up for weeks so it, it was just hard for me to believe they were going to pack him up the same way they've been packing him up with the numbers game on the PLE so just wanted to mention that uh it was an okay match it was an okay match I personally think I know some people wanted Finn Balor to win but it's just how they booked it i was like most likely damian priest is gonna get the win there i don't know if this feud's over we're gonna see what happens on monday night raw it may not be over i'm not sure but we'll see um but now now i can do the outro man all right <laughs> so let's try this again what y'all rate the show on a scale of one to ten me personally i'm gonna give this a solid the matches in the middle of the card were okay to serviceable. They weren't bad by any means, but they were they were good. I enjoyed them for the most part. But clearly the best matches of the night. Hell in a Cell match and the tag team match between Roman and Cody versus Solo and Jacob Fatu. Those stole the show and the stuff happening afterwards. It was fantastic. I'm going to give this a solid nine. This was a nine show. This was fun, bro. This was fun. And I enjoyed this. Even the matches that weren't the, you know, the best. I still enjoyed what I saw. And I love to see what's going on. We got some more story. It's going to happen with uh, Liv and now Raquel having her back. And Rhea, what she's going to do, how she's going to overcome that. I don't know what they're going to do with Finn Balor and Damian Priest if that feud's over. And obviously they're teasing something with uh, with uh, Liv and uh, with... Um, What's the name? They're teasing something with, uh, I can't even think of his name right now. Her name. Tiffany Stratton and um, and Naya. Oh, I'm also forgetting one more thing. Guther did make his appearance. I'm sorry about this. I'm just all over the place because just so excited. Guther did make his appearance. He did make his appearance uh, when uh, Triple H talked about the championship or whatnot. And he saw Goldberg out there. And Guther being such a good heel, he's like, yeah, I did say you were my favorite. A wrestler to Brett, but I was lying. You're really not, you know, you're not that good. You're a has been. And uh he's like, I am just busting your balls. But then he starts talking to Goldberg's son on some slick stuff. He's like, Man, hopefully he's better as a father than he was a wrestler. Goldberg said, You got me fucked up. Hop that barricade. That's when the JAG security tries to stop him. And lo and behold, as Gunther's like, come on, let's fight. Sammy Zayn with the black hoodie comes out there and starts attacking Gunther, packing him up, beating him up. Tr they trying to pull him apart. I love it. And Gunther essentially has to scurry it away as Sammy is saying, nah, my boy, you better focus up on me. 
on Monday Night Raw because I'm going to beat your ass. You got me fucked up. I'm saying, I'm Sammy with the black hoodie. It was a cool segment. I enjoyed that. It, who would have thought in 2024 I'm, I'm cheering for Goldberg to get in the ring to get packed up by Gunther? <laughs> That's probably what happened. I don't know. But that was fun. All right. Now I'm done. Now I'm done. So y'all let me know what y'all rate this show on a scale of 1 to 10. What was your favorite match? What was your least favorite match? What are you looking forward to the most going into Monday Night Raw and Friday Night SmackDown? But I appreciate all love support. Road to 150K. Appreciate y'all kicking with me. See y'all next one. Peace.